Java, as we all know, has powered enterprise software for over two decades. But with JDK 25, we are seeing one of the most significant leaps in recent years. This release brings major advances in performance, AI readiness, developer experience, and even quantum safe security. So what do these changes mean for Java developers and enterprises today? To find out, we have with us Simon Ritter, Deputy CTO at Azul, to explore how JDK 25 is reshaping the future of Java from faster startup times to smarter observability. Simon, it's great to have you on the show. Great, man. Good to be here. Let's start with performance because that's where everyone feels the impact first. JDK 25 introduces compact object headers and new AOT optimizations. Which of these do you think deliver the biggest real world gains, especially for enterprise workloads where the startup time and throughput really matter? The, the thing with those is that they're, they're kind of slightly different in their approach to how they, they, they solve the performance problem. Because if we look at the object headers and the compact object headers, the idea behind that is to reduce the amount of space that's used in the heap. So we've seen some pretty impressive results with that. There was one particular benchmark, which is very commonly used, spec JBB. Um, that's a sort of enterprise benchmark that a lot of people look at. And when they ran that with the compact object headers, they got 22% less um, in terms of the heap space and 8% less in terms of the, um, the, the um, CPU utilization. So that's, that's a good thing in terms of the overall performance of your application. But from the ahead of time situation, what that is looking at is how quickly you can get your application to its optimum level of performance. And that's one of the things that Java's always struggled with is the fact that because it is a um, interpreted language, it has bytecodes rather than native instructions. What we have to do is go through this warm up where we adaptively compile Frequently used, frequently used pieces of code, and we do that gradually. So it takes time to find all those pieces of code and compile them. Now, what Head of Time is doing is saying, okay, well, rather than starting from scratch every time you start the same application, that's very relevant when you're running a microservice and you're starting up multiple instances. What we'll do is we'll start up the application, and then when it's reached its optimum level of performance, take a snapshot of what the state of the machine is so that when we start again we can feed that back in and have an idea of what happened before and then take advantage of that so it's, it's very useful in that respect and beyond these what are the things that you are personally excited about in this release yeah i mean there's, there's a lot of work going on at the language level um, and there's a bigger project called Amber, which is delivering sort of features as we go through. And the thing with uh, Project Amber is there's gradual sort of additions to the language. And some of the things that I've certainly seen recently, which I really like, are around pattern matching. And we're gradually making that more and more part of the language. So I'm, I'm sort of impressed at the way these things have been added. And JDK25 has more advances in that particular area. With Project Panama maturing and features like scoped value and vector API evolving, Java seems to be positioning itself closer to AI and data intensive workloads. Where do you see Java's place in the AI ecosystem today and can it generally compete with languages like Python or Rust for modern AI use cases? That's where the, the whole AI thing is very interesting when we talk about the, the sort of concept of using Java in that space. So a lot of people will immediately look at Java and go, ooh, it's not Python, it's not you know the, the cool language for the use of AI. But what we've got to look at carefully there is, um, certainly there's, there's a lot of work that's gone on, as you, you mentioned, Project Panama. That's a great example, because what that's designed to do is make it easier to interact with libraries which have been written in languages other than Java. So if we've got C++, C, Python even, then we can interact with those languages much more easily from Java. So we basically make method calls out to the uh, to these libraries and then get the results back. So that's one aspect that we can look at. But if you look at the way that AI applications really kind of work, yes, Python is very core to the sort of development of some of these things like the large language models and some of the frameworks. But essentially, once you start using those things and you want to take advantage of them in terms of an enterprise application, what you're really doing is just making a lot of calls to an, an endpoint of a RESTful web service. And that's what Java does very, very well. I mean, we, we've kind of built that right from the very beginning. And 
what Java can really add and, and offer in terms of AI applications is how you then use those large language models and those uh, capabilities that are behind the scenes, but then bringing that in and integrating it with your enterprise application. Because AI on its own doesn't really add any value, but AI, when you combine it with things like customer relationship management, when you combine it with uh, other sort of sales related tools or customer related tools, then you can really take advantage of that. So the way that we can use RESTful Web Services from within Java, but then get that scalability, which is what Java is so famous for, as one of the reasons why Java is still very, very popular after 30 years, is the fact that we can scale to internet size workloads and then do that bringing in the AI side of things as a sort of separate thing, but, but joining everything together. Some of the new gems like compact source files and module import declarations aim to simplify the Java experience for new developers. Do you think these changes are enough to attract fresh talent into the Java ecosystem? Or is there more the community and vendors like Azul need to do to make Java more approachable? Yeah, I mean, th this is certainly some some useful work that the OpenJDK developers have done. And I, I you know, I, I support the idea. But for me personally, it's not the most important thing. Um, as I said, we, we have this Project Amber. Project Amber is all about improving the Java language. And that really makes a big difference to people who are, you know, skilled developers, people who have a lot of experience there. Now, when we talk about like people approaching the language from new, so if you talk about students and people who haven't programmed in Java before, then yes, when you write your very first program, there is a lot of uh, what they describe as the ceremony involved in it, or a lot of boilerplate code. So you have to create a class, you have to create a, a main method, which is, you know, then defined as public static void main. You pass in some parameters which you don't use. And, and there's a lot of extra code, which looks very complicated when you write that first program that says hello world. And what they've done in terms of the, the idea behind the changes to the language is to simplify that. So as you said, you know, we do have compact source files. We do have the idea of, you know, um, basically implicit classes and things like that, which is great. So when you want to write your very first program and do hello world, it's much easier. However, once you go beyond that and you want to write anything that's actually like a real world application, then you still have to understand all the concepts of object-oriented programming. You still have to get the idea of encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, so whilst it helps with that very first application, it, it sort of doesn't really make a huge difference once you go beyond that. So it might have help in terms of the appeal for that very first application. But I think things like Project Amber, where we're making more changes to the, the language to simplify some of the tasks that people have on a regular basis and some of the libraries that are being added as well. I think those are much more valuable from the idea of making Java more appealing to a wider range of, of developers and making them more productive. Security is also getting a lot of attention in this release. JDK25 introduces post-quantum cryptography building blocks like the key derivation function API. How does Azul approach the shift towards quantum safe Java and what role do you see Java playing in securing enterprise applications in the post-quantum era? Yes, I mean, security is or should be always an absolute primary concern for anybody who's running IT systems. We only have to look at recent events that have happened, you know, in terms of certainly like I live in the UK. So you look at the attack that has taken place on people like Jaguar Land Rover, that's caused them to shut down their production for weeks on end, tens of millions of pounds in terms of cost, uh, various other organizations here in the UK that have been attacked, data breaches and so on, and even supply chain attacks. Uh, if you look at things like the, the NPM attack that happened recently where people were injecting code into uh, libraries so they get pulled into an application automatically. Security should definitely be absolutely a, a priority for everybody. Um, when it comes to the sort of quantum cryptography and the post-quantum cryptography, post-quantum cryptography idea. Um, obviously, from a, a Azul perspective, we're definitely doing everything we can to support that in terms of the OpenJDK development and so on. 
And I think that this is, again, what we've seen over many decades, where it's a constant battle between the people who want to try and break into systems and the people who want to stop them from breaking into systems. And cryptography is one of those things that as computers become more powerful, it becomes easier to take on some of the algorithms that have been developed. So we can see that, you know, simple replacement algorithms, you can easily defeat those with with you know fairly basic computers so we start using more and more interesting and complex algorithms which are you know um, one way only so you can't reverse the algorithm and then you get into the idea of where you can use quantum quantum computing which essentially applies you know a whole lot of values to something in a single operation so massive parallelism which then breaks things in terms of the cryptography so we need ways of addressing that and that post quantum idea that's being included in java now is very much about addressing that and looking at how we can defeat the people but it's going to be a constant battle we'll we'll continue to look at you know ways to to defeat people and then we'll look at ways to find ways around that so it's it is an ongoing concern since we are talking about security, let's talk about observability as well. Observability continues to evolve with enhancement to JFR, including method timing, cooperative sampling, and CPU time profiling. How important is this level of visibility in cloud-native and AI-driven environments? And where do you see gaps that need to be filled for developers and operators? Again, you see, this is something that, that's a very much an ongoing process is looking at ways that we can increase observability and with the again the shift to the cloud it's more important really now than ever because if you think about the way that we deploy things in the cloud we're using and taking advantage of you know the the way that we charge for things so it's a, a usage-based charge model the more you use the more you pay the less you use the less you pay so that's great but what you need to be able to do is identify where you're using resources and then look at how you can increase efficiency, because if you can increase efficiency, you can reduce your costs. So the, the utility-based pricing model is, is great, but we need to figure out how to reduce that. And that's where observability really comes in. It's finding all the places where you're actually using resources and then thinking, OK, can I reduce that resource utilization in different ways? So the observability is, is very important for that. What we're seeing more and more is that the tools like Java Flight Recorder and Mission Control are allowing us to get a more detailed picture of what's actually going on inside a Java application inside the JVM. And the, the way that we sort of get that information is it's a sort of double-edged sword in a way, because on the one hand, what you want is as much information as possible in order to determine where you've got bottlenecks, where you've got wasted resources. But of course, um, you know, we suffer from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in terms of instrumentation and observability, because, you know, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is actually about quantum mechanics. Um, I did physics at university, and it's, it's really the idea that when you observe something, you actually change what you're observing. And the same thing applies in computer software and instrumentation, because if you think about it, if you start instrumenting every method that you call and taking information when you enter the method and taking information when you exit the method, if you only do that for like one or two methods, it doesn't have a big impact on the performance of your application. If you do it for every single app method, then you actually distort the performance of your application. You slow it down by observing what it's doing. So then you get false result, results about the way the application is working. What we've seen with some of the changes in JDK 25 is the ability to very much sort of focus on a narrow set of information and say, OK, I want to look at things specific to method profiling, but only for certain methods. So we don't swamp the system and distort the results that we get. And that's a very powerful thing to be able to do. Certainly, the other side of that is the tooling so you know when we look at the data that we're collecting great we can collect lots of data about how an application is running but mm -hmm. it's then interpreting that and being able to say right how do we look at that information in a way that is useful and gives us data about where we are potentially got bottlenecks or wasted resources so there are tools like mission control that do a much more graphical approach and say okay take that data show graphs that indicate where object allocation is happening and so on. And at Azul, you know, we're doing a similar thing. We have a tool called Z Vision, and that's 
targeted at our platform prime product, which is the high performance JVM. So we can collect more information about how our JVM works internally to allow us to tune that more to get better performance from it. Many enterprises are still running older LTS versions of Java. What are some of the practical considerations or migration challenges they should keep in mind when moving to JDK 25, especially around performance tuning or dependency management? Obviously, you know, in a perfect world, what we would do is we would simply take our Java application and we would move it to the latest version, take advantage of all the, the good things that are being included in each update. And that would be the simple thing to do. But the reality is that, you know, the way that enterprises work, that isn't practical in many ways. For a simple thing is that, you know, you, you write an application, you build an application on a particular version of Java, and then you do all your testing on that version. So if you wanted to move it to a newer version of Java, then realistically, if you want to have a mission critical application that you know you rely on very heavily, you want to do all that testing again every time you change the version of Java, because as you quite rightly point out, you know, things get deprecated, things get removed, things get added, the way that things work changes slightly internally. So even from a functional perspective, everything is working the same for different aspects. There might be performance changes which you know change the, the dynamics of an application. So that can lead to potential issues with your application. So a lot of enterprises are going to say, well, you know, we've got our application. It's running on JDK 8. It's running on JDK 11, 17, 21. We're just going to keep it running on that. And we'll update it from a security perspective and any bug fixes. But we don't see the need to move directly to a newer version because We've written the code. We don't need to take advantage of new features in the, the language and so on. We don't need new libraries. Um, yeah, sure, the performance things might be useful, but if we've set it up and it's running in the way we want it to, we're not actually facing performance issues, then the old adage of if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it really applies. So just leave it running on those older versions. But yes, for, for newer greenfield type developments then yes you really want to be looking at using the latest jdk especially the long-term support ones and making sure that you've got extended maintenance and support for those now looking beyond this release what's next on the java roadmap that excites you are there upcoming jeps or trends you think will have a major impact on how developers build and run applications over the next few years I think the big thing is that we are getting closer to, there's another big project that's part of OpenJDK, and that's called Valhalla. And this is about what are called value types. It's been a project that's been going on for several years now. It is quite a big change, not so much in terms of the language itself. Um, it's quite a big change underneath, but it does lead to significantly improved performance in many situations. And so the, the inclusion of what are called value types into the Java language, this will allow us to do things underneath, which, as I say, will, will result in much better performance. So the, the idea is that, uh, you know, if we get into a little bit more technical, um, everything in Java is primarily referred to as an object. So we, we deal with objects all the time. It's an object or any programming language. But we also have the idea of primitive types in Java, and that's you know, numbers, characters, booleans, and so on. And the reason for that is because we get better performance if we treat things as just a primitive number rather than wrapping it as an object. So what Project Valhalla will allow us to do with value types is, is code like an object, but perform like a primitive. And that buys us a lot of good things in terms of the overall platform and, and how we can get performance better. So I think that that's definitely something that we're looking at. And that certainly I know that I was at a conference last week and talking to people about this. It's something that people are getting quite excited about because I think we're getting close to having some of those things included in the JDK. Um, you mentioned earlier on the, the Vector API, and that's part of Project Valhalla that's been all delivered already. It's, it's sort of slightly separate, but related to that. So there's, there's lots of good things coming in that respect. Simon, thank you so much for sharing these insights with us. I really enjoyed this conversation and I look forward to having you back on the show. Thank you. And for those watching, if you want to stay up to date on how Java and cloud native technologies are evolving and to learn more about what Azul is doing in this space, make sure to check out their work. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to TFR, like this video and share it with your team. Thanks for watching.